Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. Well, today we're going to talk about something I'm guessing most of you haven't heard about because I know I didn't hear about it until today's guest brought it to my attention. But it is nonetheless an important story because of its implications and because the lessons that we can glean from it. I'm referring to a windfall profit tax that was passed on banks in Italy. And here to tell us all about it is an objectivist philosopher who received his bachelor's degree from MIT, his doctorate from Columbia. He's also the author of numerous books, including The Biological Basis of Teleological Concepts and How We Know. Dr. Harry Binswanger, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Michael. I'm glad to be here. Well, again, it's always an honor anytime we can have you on. Okay, so first off, what are the f- basic facts of, of the case? What happened in Italy? Okay, the there's only one fact I know, and there's only one fact you need to know, and it, that came across the crawl on uh, CNBC where I was watching the stock market uh, commentary. Italy imposed a 40% windfall profits tax on banks. And they did this out of the blue as a response to higher than average profits. Windfall profits are bigger than average profits that were unanticipated. Uh, Incidentally, they have to be unanticipated because if you knew you were going to get a 40% profit, you would expand your activities until you were making the average rate of profit or competitors would come in and get you down to the average rate of profit on a bigger volume, on more production. But anyway, there was a um, some kind of special profit that was made by banks And that was considered something that should be slapped down or should be siphoned away uh, or something that should be looted, depending upon your perspective. And what I was struck by was the moral implications of doing that kind of thing. Why, Why did they put a tax on that? They don't, for instance, when a labor union gets a big rise after a strike settlement, they don't put a windfall profits tax on the workers. And yet it's the same thing. They are getting a a big boost in their uh, reward for their services, whether you're selling widgets or selling your labor, it's the same thing. It's not a different metaphysical status. So why is it that banks in particular and profit in particular are considered immoral? Or let us put it another way, unearned. That's that's what I wanted to explore. So the, the you know basic facts, big profit, hostility. That's the basic fact. And it's no accident that Rome, the center of Italy and the head of the governing capital, surrounds the Vatican, or the Vatican is in the heart of Rome. This is a Christian attitude towards profit. This is a profit hating premise that comes from Christianity and from religion in general and uh, faith and mysticism, the whole axis of the otherworldly perspective. It's not perspective, fantasy, nightmare. I don't wanna you know, talk on indefinitely you can jump in here anytime oh oh i i I wanted to let you finish i was trying to trying to show definitely no you draw me out because there's a lot more okay yes there is so there's one 
hiccup in, in the narrative you just gave from my point of view. I'm all for profit. Love it. Think that profit is the essence of the successful life, whether it be profit in terms of money or profit in terms of I'm just gaining in my spiritual life or gaining friendships. It's all profit when it's you basically get a return on whatever investment you happen to make. Love profit. The hiccup for me, and it's in this case, and it complicates all economic analysis, the, at least the morality of economic analysis, and more than that, is this. The Italian government raised interest rates. That is in part why the profits of the bank went up, the banks went up. So what the, of course, the government then argues and the people argue is, well, you got this windfall because of the government, but yet you're not dispersing the benefits. Now, in the numerous articles that I sifted through on this topic, I didn't see anything about the banks complaining when the government raised the interest rates that they were going to be charging. They didn't then step forward and say, we don't need government interference in our in our lives. It, it seems to be a problem only when the government steps in on the other end. And it, I just think that it, we, and I know you don't need to know this, but I'm just saying in general, us advocates of capitalism need to be consistent on this point. Yeah, but that's a big mistake. You're making a big mistake, but this is a higher order big mistake than the fundamental thing I wanted to talk about. But let's let's take a step into it. Um, the government comes in and starts to strangle you. They got their hands on your throat and they're choking yeah. off your air. Okay. Then the government says, follow our orders or we'll totally kill you. And so you do what they say. And then they say, okay, I'm letting you have a little more air. And a bystander says, hey, the government is giving them something. That's not fair. So when government intervenes in business, that doesn't mean you then look upon any gains that the, that the business gets as ill-gotten because they come from the government. The government can never make up, never, for the harm it has done to the banks and to the economy in general and to you and to me. Mm -hmm. So the same principle that makes it moral for me to take any of the dispersed loot that the government is throwing around makes it moral for businesses to do so and you shouldn't look upon that as a business colluding with government now there is if they initiate something new that's when you look upon it as business colluding from government if they go to government and say uh i'll give you an example of that pfizer disgracefully generally a good company tried to and successfully exercise the government's wrongful power of eminent domain to drive Suzette Kilo out of her home in, uh, I think it was New London, Connecticut. New it's London, in Connecticut, your, yeah. your area. It's in New London, right? yes. And it should be noted that former President Donald Trump praised that decision vehemently and never walked away from his support of it. Uh, I can go on about that because <laughs> I have a personal connection there. Um, the Pfizer went to the New England, uh, New London uh, Town Council or whatever it is and said, we'd like to build a plant there, but we need some land next to where we're uh, a part of the kind of industrial park we're going to build there, but we can't get it. Would you condemn it and let us take it? And the government said, sure, we'd love to, because then we'd have your tax revenue. That was the explicit rationale. I was in the Supreme Court hearing where the Kilo versus New London case was tried. I was present physically in the courtroom listening to the arguments before the Supreme Court as a guest. 
uh, the rationale for Pfizer taking um, Suzette Kilo's house to build was was given was it's for the good of the public because it'll raise tax revenue, which is so perverted an idea. That's an example of when you can say this is business initiating force against an individual and it's immoral. But if the um, if the government lets business make more money by its unrelated activities, the business are not businesses that are regulated by the government are not colluding with it and they're not to be judged as guilty. Otherwise, we might as well pack it in. It's, I mean, we have to use, remember what Hillary Clinton said? Well, you're educated by the yes, government. I, I agree with you, you. Use the roads, right? So you're you owe us. And and um it's it's wrong to uh think when you have business forcibly in bed with government that it gets blamed. Oh, so hold on one second. I just want to be clear. I'm not blaming banks because the government raised interest rates. All I'm mm -hmm. saying is that for an advocate of capitalism, what we ought to be doing is arguing that the government get out of the business of regulating interest rates altogether, that they be dictated by free market interactions rather than government bureaucrats. Yes. And there's a much wider principle. The government should get out of money. Yes. The government today has socialized money. If you don't want socialism in oh, the shoe making, why do you want socialism in the money, in the business of producing the medium of exchange and uh, keeping it and acting as a loan broker, which is what banks do? So, uh, yeah, the government in the 19th century. I know nobody on this call except very diehard uh, fans of laissez-faire capitalism know this. There were there was no government paper money in the 19th century, except during the Civil War when they printed it to fleece the people and they were called greenbacks. The money was issued by banks who were free, which were free, private money. I have some examples of it over in my bookshelf of private money. So uh, the, the government should have absolutely nothing to do with the money, not just not set interest rates. They shouldn't print bills, uh, banknotes uh, that, well, they're called banknotes. It should be issued by banks. Now, getting back to one little tiny point. So the basic point is, uh, profit is good. That's what I want to talk about. The secondary point is, well, it's kind of messed up because some of the profits of business are due to what government does. And I say, if they didn't ask for that favor, it's a return of what's been stolen from them. And it's not messed up. The same principles still apply. Uh, but then the little tiny point on top of that, I don't think it helps banks when interest rates are raised. Why would the banks be better off? Banks uh, borrow uh, short to lend long, or is it the other way around? <laughs> they make money on the spread. I don't know. Right? But they made money here in this case because they charged more on the loans that they were making, but they didn't increase the amounts that they were paying depositors. So the interest rate goes up. The interest rates didn't go up on the on what they were paying to their lenders, the depositors. The interest rates just went up on the money they were taking. Well, how would that be possible? Well, that's what they did, according to the papers anyway. I mean, I read, I have searched over maybe yeah, four or five articles. It's not possible. It's not possible that um, you you make more profit, but none of it is passed on in, in the form of, um, in this case, uh, higher interest rates to savings depositors. You can't do that. That is against the 
I don't mean you shouldn't do it. I mean, it's impossible to sustain that for more, more than momentary uh, time period because of competition. Well, yeah. Well, what they argued was that um, basically that these were operating costs, that the, that the increases that they got in the interest rate, they, they're using for operating costs, and that's why they didn't disperse it amongst depositors. Then the, the government turns well, around. Then maybe they had been – maybe they were uh, – being squeezed by the previous position of the government. Yes. But what I'm what I'm saying is that um I don't think it's true that uh, this gets into detailed economics, but it doesn't make any sense that the absolute height of interest rates would influence the profit rate of banks. It's like saying, oh, if the dollar goes up against the yen, then currency traders make a better profit. They make more money when the dollar is higher so that it takes 500 yen to buy a dollar rather than the previous level of 100 yen. That wouldn't lead to one penny more profit. That would be the same fallacy as saying, oh, I guess the diamond merchants make a lot more profit than the people selling scrap paper or something cheap um you know uh, newspapers yeah. well, people making newspapers must not make as much money as the people selling diamonds because diamonds are so no they make the same rate of profit so i well, don't see how the absolute level would matter the the problem is is that the in, in this case the profits did go up i don't know if the profits that went up were caused by the raise in the interest rate but that's the argument uh, ultimately it's very difficult mm -hmm. ever to distinguish what exactly is causing a rise in profits but the principle that you're talking about where the, the rate of profit tends to hit an average is based on free competition, which we don't have free competition in banking here. So I doubt they have oh. free competition in banking in Italy. But I, I kind of oh, no. want I kind of want to get to your 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 main point, which is this. There is a hostility to profits. It's not just in right. Italy. It seems to be everywhere and that is just profit for the sake of profit is thought to be wrong like when people say that they, you know they're raking it in and they're not paying their employees what they should be and you know they're they're getting too rich they're, they're price gouging all those sorts of things they're all slogans and sayings that are meant to deride profit and my question yeah. to you is what do you think leads to the, the hate first of all let me flip this a little bit why is profit good and once we do that, then I want to get into why people, yeah, given that it's yeah, good, hate yeah. it. So why is profit good? Well, let's ask what is profit? Because you're right. The issue is, is profit itself good or bad? What is profit? Profit is the excess of sales revenue above costs. So if you buy materials to bake bread uh, and it costs you a dollar, and the cake that you make or the bread that you make from it, you sell for $1.50, your profit is 50 cents, right? So what, it, what does that mean that you've done? It means that you paid a market price of a dollar for things that you then rearranged, did work on, and we're able to sell it back in the same market. I mean, it's a technique, you know, in the same public sphere for $1.50. So the 50 cents is the increase in market value that you created. So profit is actually value creation. If you think about it, you, you started with a dollar you started that with things that the market valued at $1. So at $1, people were willing to sell it to you, and you were willing to pay that dollar. What you got at the end was something that this market would pay you $1.50 for. So you made 50 cents of new value. You created that. So to be against profit, to look upon it with hostility, is to be against value creation. 
But life is value creation. Human life, anyway. Necessitates animals, it. Yeah, animals seize things in nature. Cows munch the grass that's there. Um, birds eat the seed and insects that are there. They just grab what's already in nature. But human beings produce. They don't just grab. They work things up into a state that better serves human life. And we see this constantly everywhere. Everything we do in working in our field is creating value. That's why we do it. And every new thing, like a, a, a new wonder drug, is something that didn't exist before, but people figured out how to do it and uh, created value that wasn't there before. So uh, to be against the, the creation of value is to be against human life as such. And that's what underlies the anti-profit act. Uh, attitude people are against human life as such what who could be against human life as such religions religions are as Nietzsche said life loathing itself religion is the uh, desire for uh, life after death it's a desire for death so you can live in a way but that you can exist in a way without living. Like in the Garden of Eden, that's what heaven is, <laughs> would be like. You don't have to work for anything. No, no production. The, no production in, in the uh, Islamic variety. If you were really good, you get sexual favors from virgins. Uh, so you get pleasure. Uh, you're otherwise just enthralled to be in the presence of God, why that is so enthralling. I mean, who you are and why that's enthralling is all yeah. just just a, <laughs> a silly childish fantasy. Sure. But I, I it's think it's the, important. It's uh, the hatred of this life that leads to uh, the longing for a life where you don't have to work, you don't have to think, you don't have to earn anything. And yes. that's what profits are earned value, yeah. they're earned reward for creation. And the people who don't want to have to earn anything, who want the unearned, uh, hate profit and their their natural home and source is religion. So to summarize kind of your point about profit, Isabel Patterson noted that production is profit. By definition, when you bring something new into existence, value creation, you've profited. And human progress and human life, unless we're going to live in a cave, requires production, profit, things to keep increasing for our lives to get better. This applies, in my view, even to cases where if I go and uh, buy the uh, purple shirt from Harry Bizwanger. I walk down the street and I buy it for a dollar and I walk down the street and sell it for a dollar 50. Some people say, Oh, look, he's just the price gouging. This person could have got, it got it for a dollar and said he's paying a dollar 50. Well, in actuality, he couldn't get it for a dollar because he didn't know about it. So in right. that sense, I've created the value of providing him with the shirt. And that's why I get the 50 cents. It's value that I've created a service provided. And I think a lot of people seem to not understand that, that one production is profit and the obverse is true that profit is production, but also there's more than just, I've made something if physical that constitutes production, you can produce services as well. Yeah. Uh, Isabel Patterson is someone that I really admire but she's not quite right on this point. Net uh -oh. production, net production is physical profit, not production. If you um, if you plant a potato, yes, and you know potatoes have their own seeds in them, and you get three potatoes, uh, what's your profit? 
your profit is too potato. Profit in the physical sense. You know, yeah. Your your gain is two potato, but your production is three potatoes. So the money, the product, the production that goes to pay costs, the sales revenue that goes to pay costs, you produce that, but it's not profit. It's, so it's net production that's profit. The other thing is it's a little dangerous. I mean, she's right physically and philosophically, but economically, profit is monetary. Profit is market value gain. If you produce a, a whole lot of potatoes, but no one wants potatoes, you haven't created economic profit. Okay, so, fair enough. Okay, but I mean, she's... I. I don't like criticizing her because she was that book that got in the machine is a fantastic book. Uh, and um, that point is true physically that net production profit is net production. The value added. It's a value created in addition to what you started with. So um, why why is there particular animus against banks? You know, you said there's a hiccup. The banks are in the pocket of the government, which they are, or they're profiting from the government decision. Yes, that's true. But banking is, that's not why people dislike and distrust banks when they're thinking politically. They don't dislike them when they come to deposit or withdraw their money, but when they're thinking or get a loan, but when they're thinking politically, bankers, oh yeah. Why are they particularly disliked? Because they make money on money, right? They don't, they don't uh, roll up their sleeves and put their hands in the dirt and plant potatoes. They don't hammer out horseshoes on a blacksmith forge, they make money on money. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, it's too cerebral. It's too cerebral. And money is the root of all evil. Why is it the root of all evil? So using your mind to deal with the filthy lucre, the root of all evil, is like the worst kind of capitalism people think, the worst kind of exploitation. Well, there's two premises. One I've kind of alluded to, that production is only physical, which is impossible to maintain. Marx thought that. It's only physical labor that creates. Oh, yeah, what are all those programmers doing? What are all the people, the webmasters doing? What are all the pharmaceutical scientists doing profit comes from the use of the mind the intellect and finance the kind of profit that bankers make is the most purely intellectual of all of them so if you're against work against earning you're against the mind and you rationalize that, oh, only the men on the assembly line, they're the ones that are really doing the work. There's no value creation and making money on money. So that's one premise is that muscles are the only thing that count. The mind is irrelevant. The other is closely related. Selfishness is evil. And that's the real thing that I think is driving the Italian hostility and the American hostility to making money. And this is what's behind Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and Trump in his anti-capitalist moods uh, and everybody who looks with hostility and suspicion on people's money, on wealth, and earning money on money. They think that selfishness is bad. Self, Mother Teresa, now there's a person. There's someone to emulate. There's a moral heroine. Well, I disagree. 
the moral heroes and heroines are the people who create value using their minds, not the people who <clears throat> sacrifice everything to the lowest specimens of humanity they can find. So the question is, are you in favor of life or are you against it? If you're in favor of life, you have to be in favor of profit, in favor of earning, in favor of the mind. If you're against life, then you're against all three. What was Adam's sin? What did he do that we're all stained with his sin? He ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, which is a symbolic way of saying that he sought to know. That is what the stagnant mentality regards as bad. That's what they want to stop. And profits, money made on money in particular, is the symbol to them of everything that they are against because they are against life itself. So that's why I was so horrified by this windfall profits tax. It's like saying, oh, well, if you extra, you get an extra benefit in your life and you're happier than you should be, we got to stop that. It's a disgustingly immoral attitude by the life hater. So how this is something that I come across is in trying to advocate for capitalism, first of all, you have to overcome misunderstandings of what capitalism actually is. For instance, yeah. Donald Trump is presented as a big advocate for capitalism. Now, he supported the Kelo decision that you mentioned earlier. The Kelo decision involved the government taking of private property to give to a private entity. That is clearly a, a violation of property rights. The, I don't see any other way it can be looked at, yet Trump supported it. And many people say, well, Trump is the symbol of capitalism. So no, that's I the think first you're thing. living in the past, Michael. You're living in the past. Come into the modern world. The conservative movement no longer cares about capitalism. No, they They're... don't, but they claim to. No, not yeah, at much. least, well, no. you're right. A lot of them don't. I'm, 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 you're right yeah, about the that. The Trumpers, the Trumpers don't say, "Well, he's a big advocate of capitalism." And say he's a big advocate of America. He well, wants I, to on social media. Border. The people yeah. I in, in, interact with on social media, they say that Donald Trump is not only a capitalist, but many people tell me, "How can I like him? He's the equivalent of an Ayn Rand hero." People, I mean, somebody yesterday compared him to Hank Reardon. I mean, this is a, a palpably absurd yeah. to anyone with any understanding. Yeah. But nonetheless, yeah. that is out there. And that has to be oh, yeah. overcome, yeah. it seems to me. But they're not, the extent that they, the Trumpers talk about capitalism on social media, it's on the kind of websites that are pro-capitalist. You know, they don't talk about that amongst themselves. And it's not oh. that uh, Trump is known as a advocate of capitalism or anything. He's known as he wants to keep, make America great again, which is like Germany arise, uh, Germany wake up. Your destiny is going to be fulfilled. So it's like, uh, and and it's a justified. There's a justified element in it, which is people are suffering under the regulatory state and the it's a mix of you know some bad elements and some good response to the left so they know the left the trumpers know the left are, are wrong and bad and uh they don't know what's good it, but the, what the what they're against is like a gender fluidity which I'm against too, you know, from the left and wokeness, which is a kind of reverse racism uh, and uh, what a, a immigration, I'm pro-immigration. That's, uh, I part with them there. I want much more immigration. 
uh, without any controls. That's you know, uh, as to immigration, I just w- want to give you some props for immigration. I've been pro-immigration, but your argument drove me to where I am right now about the the, the rights, not only of the immigrants, but of the people in this country that want to deal with them. That, to me, yeah. was a missing piece from my thinking on the subject. And when I heard mm-hmm. you talk about it and then I talked about it with you, you know, over the, the, the Zoom, it really drove the point home for me. So I, I would just want to thank you for that. It's kind of ancillary in some ways to what we're talking about. But nonetheless, it just jogged my memory and I wanted to let you know. Well, I appreciate that. And I reach someone. Uh, it's you can't be opposed to the regulatory state and be pro regulating immigration. It's a contradiction. And I'll give you the the argument that really buffaloes or blows the mind of the conservative. You shouldn't regulate guns, right? Now, if you ask them why, they say because of the Second Amendment. But that's only a a legal uh, issue. Why morally should guns not be regulated? Is because the innocent can't be held responsible for the sins of the guilty. So, yes, somebody gets a gun and goes and shoots up school children. That's not a reason why I can't own a gun. I'm not him. I'm me. And uh, the same for you. So the fact that some people in a group um, are doing bad things doesn't mean you can regard everybody as guilty and treat them the way you would a person who's just about to grab a gun and shoot up a school. So by the same token, you can't treat every immigrant as if he's a a cartel member or a rapist or a welfare bum. There are surprisingly few of those among immigrants, but there are those. But what about the ones who are not? You can't hold people guilty until they're proven innocent. Right. And there are plenty of those people in the United States, Native American citizens, and we don't regulate people's, uh, you know, activity, make them periodically come before a board and show that they are upstanding in order to continue out of jail here. So you can't do that at the border either. Anyway, that's it. So if you're against regulating guns, you should be against regulating anything. Okay. Anything, nothing okay. is, nobody should be treated as having to prove to the government that he's not going to commit a crime. If there's specific evidence he's planning a crime or maybe he has committed it, then you go after that. But you can't just, you know, investigate okay. and regulate. Let's put everybody in prison. Yes, and because that somebody way, might commit a crime. Yeah, right. we'll put everybody in prison and we'll be safe. And this well, what, be. what you just pointed out, it, the contradictions between the conservative view on guns and immigration goes to the heart of the, the, the first part of what I'm asking you is how it, there's so many when people with such contradictory ideas are taken as advocates of capitalism, it makes it different, difficult to advocate for it. And again, it comes back to me to the anti-life premise that you've been talking about, because. If you're pro-life, be pro-life. The, the, li- the lives of people are no less worthy just because they happen to be across an artificial border that's been drawn by governments. They're still human yeah. beings with the same rights as, as everybody else. And, exactly. we, and you got to sort of cut through the knot of contradictions. But assuming we do that, then what is the best way to advocate for capitalism? The best way to advocate for capitalism is um, right behind you on the wall. <clears throat> Be an, a rational egoist. Advocate rational egoism. That's the thing that sunk capitalism in this country. It was the morality of self-sacrifice, the morality of live for others that eventually caught on due to the work of German philosophers in the uh, the same time as the American Revolution was establishing the rights of man and the right, excuse me, to the pursuit of happiness, German philosophers were preparing a counterattack. 
And eventually that succeeded because it was the intellectual philosophical dominant trend that couldn't be answered. No one had answers until Ayn Rand of the tricky arguments they had. And they were writing on the backs of religion. So America got away from capitalism more and more and more because capitalism means egoism. Capitalism means your life is yours to live as you choose, as long as you respect the rights of everyone else to live as they choose. There's only one principle of capitalism. Nobody coerces anybody. The government responds with retaliation if somebody starts the use of force. But nobody is morally permitted to start the use of force, including the government. The government can't initiate force against innocent people, <clears throat> which is what it's been doing more and more and more starting in about 1880 was the passage of the Sherman Antitrust Act. <clears throat> so it's been getting less capitalist for a long time. And uh, it's going to continue unless the morality of self-sacrifice, which is known as altruism, uh, is rejected. And, uh, you know, it's not even the rejection. It's the acceptance of the morality of egoism. And the acceptance of reason is man's only means of knowledge. So appeals to the Bible are out. Appeals to mystical experience are out. Appeals to what the Pope says are out. Only what you can prove with your own use of reason is acceptable. And you can't prove with reason that self-sacrifice is anything other than self-destruction and anti-value. But you can prove using reason that the meaning of value is that which serves your life. And you can develop, as Ayn Rand has, a selfishness morality, a morality of rational selfishness. Now, I had one other point that I wanted to make, if I can, Michael. That's Oh, um, sure. Go ahead. People, people think, <clears throat> I mean, most people think that if there's a lot of money involved, then people become irrational and try to grab it. But they know that this is actually the reverse of the truth. Suppose you're playing poker and somebody says, this is penny ante stuff. Let's, let's raise the stakes. So we're going to make it now $500 minimum bet and no maximum. So there's going to be maybe $50,000 in every pot, whereas before it was maybe $5 in every pot. So we, now we've raised the sake, we brought in money. Are people more likely to think in that situation or less likely? I say <clears throat> when you raise the stakes, you call out people's thinking. They are going to be more rational when there's more value involved. And we see this in, in um, if people would admit it, in society. If you wanted to uh, find a person who was concerned to do the right thing and was polite and respectful of others and was thoughtful and genial, benevolent, do you think you would find that more among investment bankers on Wall Street or among the patrons of a whorehouse at some backwater place in Texas. <laughs> I mean, I, I know people, and maybe I should end with the Kilo and Trump connection. All right. Um, I know people on Wall Street in, in banking and in finance, uh, and they are very 
admirable, honorable people that you would be delighted to have dinner with. And I know a few, not very many, lugs, uh, couch potatoes, poor slum dwelling kind of people. You don't. Those are not where you go to find high moral standards. So people actually, if they would admit it to themselves, know that uh, it, it's not true that more money means more bestiality, more uh, jungle behavior. It's just the opposite. Raise the stakes and people's best attitudes come out. People's morality, people's uh, reason, uh, people's honor comes to the fore there. And I'm looking for other... Uh, uh, points I want to make, but I've made most. Oh, yeah, we were going to talk about Kilo. Can you, you got a minute to, to talk about the personal? Yes, this is just accidental. Absolutely. This is accidental. <clears throat> the defense at the Supreme Court of Suzette Kilo's property rights, she lost the case, Yeah, but the defense was conducted by the Institute for Justice. Uh, the Institute for Justice is a wonderful organization headquartered in the D.C. area that fights violations of individual rights on a very personal level, like defending Suzette Kilo's attempt to stay in her house rather than see it grabbed by a corporation using government power. The person who wrote the brief, largely wrote with some help and editing from others, was my goddaughter at the Institute for Justice, Dana Berliner. Dana Berliner went up against Donald Trump some years earlier when he tried to do the same kind of maneuver in Atlantic City. He wanted to expand his parking lot for his casino, but that meant getting the land of a little old lady who was living where he wanted to put his parking lot. That little old lady was defended by Dana Berliner against Trump, she went to court and she won. So, yes, Donald Trump definitely believes in using the government power. He's tried to do it yes, to seize has. people's homes. This is their homes. This is a, a, a she was about 80, I think, a, a, the proverbial little old sweet grandmother who had been born in this house, I believe, and wanted to stay in it. And Trump wanted to build a damn parking lot for a casino. And you tried to use eminent domain and would have, were it not, would have succeeded were it not for the defense mounted by the Institute for Justice and my goddaughter. So wow. now when I say my goddaughter, there's no religion in that. <laughs> I didn't think so. Okay. That means, I didn't think so. that means the goddaughter agreement was, uh, her her father and mother were my best friends. And if something had happened to them, I was going to raise Dana. So uh, that's what it means. It's a, it's a certain agreement that you make, yeah. as I understand it. I wasn't going to accuse so, you of being religious. Thank you. <laughs> I'd never thank do you. that. Well, Dr. Binswanger, you have been able to tie together Italian banking policy, Donald Trump, <laughs> New London politics, poker games, whorehouses, and parking lots at casinos. <laughs> and, That's what philosophy does. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, before we go, where can people find you? Uh, go to HB, my initials, Harry Binswanger, hbletter.com. HB Letter is my subscription-based website, and uh, there's a free trial, two-week free trial, 
that before you have to divvy up. Uh, but you can also contact me there. And I think you can look around. I have a blog there that's free. So certain things are behind a paywall and certain things are available to the public. So go there, HB Letter. Okay. And you also do HBTV, don't you? Yeah, I do HBTV on YouTube on Mondays. I just did one yesterday on perception. I mean, talk about wide ranging. Why your senses cannot deceive you. Can and deceive you all right beautiful so, well everybody uh, check I, them out you know, check it out you will not be disappointed dr binswanger thank, thank you, you. well thank you so much for joining us dr binswanger for now i'm michael Leibowitz. this is the rational egoist signing out connected or attached to this episode will be a link to purchase my book view from a cage you can get it in both ebook or print Remember, as always, like, share, comment, subscribe. Till next time.